worship team. I appreciate so much what you do in preparing our hearts for uh, worship. And as we look at the Word together, I want you to turn in your Bibles to John 6. We're going to start with verse 1. It's the same chapter we were in last week. We took the Lord's Supper together, but it's a different uh, section of that chapter. It's one of the longest chapters in the New Testament in uh, in all of the Bible, and there's a lot of good stuff here, and I want, didn't want you to miss this. As we look at who needs a miracle? Anybody in this place need a miracle? Here's what I figured. Uh, for most of us, we all readily, willingly accept a miracle. If a miracle came our way, would we not? But very few of us, if any of us, want to be in a situation where a miracle is required. Where we have to have a miracle to get out of whatever situation we're in. Because that means there's a problem. A big problem. A huge problem. And in this text, the problem is hunger. And a whole group of people around Jesus needing just a simple meal because it's late in the day. But there's a different sort of problem or a different sort of need that maybe you have. And here's what we look at today. What is your need? Why are you as they were Looking to Jesus, why are you seeking Him? Why have you come to this place this day? When I was a, a pastor, a young pastor, I'm, not a, I'm still a pastor, I'm not a young pastor anymore, but when I was a young pastor, I went to, to Germany on a mission trip, and I came home after that trip, and, and my kids were little. In fact, Jackson was just a baby. He was a, not even quite a year old when I get, got back from that. And my older two, uh, they, they came running, and they said, Daddy, you're home. Daddy, you're home. Like they did several times since then when I, I came home from a trip like that. And, and what, they, what they would always say is what kids say when daddies come home from trips like that. What would you bring us? You know exactly. What did you bring us? And, and so I said, me. I brought me. And they said, oh, you know. And then they started rummaging through the suitcase because I had brought them, them something. Can you imagine what it would be like now? They're 27, 23, and 21. And what if I came home from a mission trip to Haiti and I'd been taken hostage by that gang in Haiti like the missionaries have in that place right now. And I got home and I said, and they said, what what did you bring us, anything? I said, me. And at this stage in life, because they're a little more mature, they would say, Daddy, you're all I want. We just wanted you to come home. Well, in this text and in this section, we're going to look. God has given us all that we need in life to supply all our needs according to His riches in glory. And He did it all at once. And He did it in Himself when Jesus came to earth. When He took the form of man. Emmanuel, God with us. He's all we need. And so this section would show us that. Now, I don't know about how you grew up and whether you grew up in church or not and whether you are familiar with the story of the feeding of the 5,000, but sometimes it's been romanticized. I think there's a lot in here for us as adults as well as young people as we look at this section today. I hope you'll see that there's a, an opportunity to appropriate the power and the sufficiency of Christ in our lives. He has what we need to meet every need. And so do we look to Him first and foremost? Because a lot of times we, we think about this world and, and we think about how hard it is. And it's a, almost a demoralizing sort of struggle. It's harsh. And we think about all of the things that demand our time and, and our abilities don't measure up and, and our, the challenges we face that loom large and our resources are, are not enough to meet all those things. Our, our intellects uh, aren't enough. They, the things that we need to know are beyond our reach sometimes. But Jesus, in who He is, and that's what we're looking at today, is enough to meet all your needs. He's sufficient. You think about the Apostle Paul, we're going to read this text in just a moment in John 6, 
But before we get there, I want to remind you, Paul, the Apostle Paul is such a gifted guy. You know, he is really smart and he's really um, driven and he's really a kind of a self-starter kind of guy. And he's, he's the greatest missionary in the history of the church. And it all started, all of our, what we know really because of the Apostle Paul and, and his movement west. We came to know Christ ourselves as we look back that Paul told somebody, that told somebody, that started a church that told somebody. We are, are richly dependent upon the Apostle Paul. But God did something in 2 Corinthians 12 with Paul's life to keep him from being too conceited. God had shown him all sorts of things. He even showed him the third heaven. The Jews believed in three sort of levels of heaven. The sky was level one where the birds fly. The stars and the sun and the moon and all that, that was like level two, like outer space. And then there's the, the place where God is. And, and God had allowed Paul to visit that place, either in a, in a vision, a dream, or, or maybe even personally. I don't know the, the power of God in his life, but he said to keep me from being conceited in that, God gave me a thorn in my flesh. Now, anybody know what that thorn was? Some people think that thorn was a woman. I can't believe that. Can you? No, that thorn, some people think it was some physical thing. There's all sorts of speculations about what the thorn is. But here's what I know. All of us have a thorn. It's not named so all of us can identify with the Apostle Paul. And when we think about what God answered his prayer about, God, Paul prayed and prayed and prayed that that thorn would be removed. And you have something like that that you've been praying for for some time, I'm quite sure. You're serious about your walk with Christ and you're serious about following Him and pursuing Him. Then you've been praying that God would remove some kind of temptation or God would remove some kind of situation from your life that things would just miraculously be healed. Paul prayed and prayed and prayed about that. You know what God said? You have got it right. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Have you ever, have you ever looked at your problems, the thing that you need a miracle for, your situations, your brokenness, your relationships, whatever it is as, as an opportunity for God to pour out His grace. Because God says to Paul, and He says to us, there's something better than pain elimination. Something better than, than thorn removal. Something better than removing all the suffering in your life. And it's called grace. Grace. God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And in this situation, when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, we'll see how we can access that kind of grace, that kind of power, that kind of sufficiency. Because as we think about it, we can't have an authentic relationship with anybody just always wondering, what, what's in it for me? Or what do I get and how do I get it? We, we can't keep asking about something to get. That's how we often approach God. Give me, give me, give me, or help me, protect me, provide for me. But at some point, we just have to realize who He is. And that all of what He has is out of who He is. And these signs that He does in the Gospel of John are all about pointing toward who Jesus is. John's whole gospel is arranged around these signs, and this is the middle sign in the gospel. And I want to, us to look at this together, and then we'll talk about those signs in just a little bit more in just a moment. Would you stand in honor of the reading of God's holy word? John 6, beginning with verse 1. After this, after what? Well, there's been about a six-month period since chapter 5. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. What were they looking for? What were these crowds that were dogging Jesus looking for? Healing. They were looking for life. It's like you and I are looking for that. 
We're looking to better our life. That's why we've come to this place. Because we're looking to find what God has for us in life and trusting in Him. And so as we look at this and continue to look at this, a huge crowd, verse 3 says, Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with His disciples around Him. And it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for Him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. And there's a, a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this, this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. And then, then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. After He did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted, after everyone was full, Jesus told His disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled twelve baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. And when the people saw Him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely He is the prophet we have been expecting. And Jesus saw that they were ready to force Him be their king. He slipped away into the hills by himself. Oh, Father, teach us. Teach us what you have for us in this passage, Lord. Lord, there are people in this place who are struggling with all sorts of things. Some physical things that they can't do anything about. That their meager resources aren't sufficient for. Lord, they trust in You. They want to trust You more. Father, there are people in this place whose marriages are falling apart because of selfishness or sin or whatever, and, and they don't know what to do about it. They can't fix it. But You can, Lord. So, Lord, we ask in all sorts of other things that are going on. We ask that you would show yourself. That you would show us who you really are. That you would uh, help us build our faith in you. Lord, it's in the power of your name we pray that you'd speak in these moments. For Father, unless you speak, I have nothing to say. In your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen. I want to set a little context here for you. Remember, this is the middle sign. There's seven basic signs in the Gospel of John. It starts back in chapter 2. When Jesus turns the water into wine. Remember that sign? And all of these are called signs in John's Gospel because they're not so much focused on the event of the miracle, but what it means and why He was doing that. And Jesus is showing in three of the signs that He does His power over the elements. So He... Turns the water, H2O, into Opus 1. I love that story. I love that passage when this, when this desperate bride and this desperate wedding party is without wine. Jesus steps in because His mama said to. He obeyed His mama and He did what she asked. He, but He reminded her, my time has not yet come. It's just a sign pointing to my power and my ability and what I can do. But my time has not yet come. In chapter 4, he heals a, a man's son, a, an official of Capernaum's son, and he does it long distance. And, and that's showing his power over disease. He does it again with an invalid in the beginning of chapter 5 with an invalid who had been there around that pool of Bethesda for 38 years. And he says these convicting words, do you want to get well? Because there's some people in life who 
who don't really want to get well. There's some people who just would rather wallow in their sickness and their illness. But Jesus wouldn't allow for that. He said, you want to get well? And he healed him there. And then we get this sign of power over the elements as he turns these uh, five loaves and two fish into enough to feed 15, 20,000 people. We'll talk more about that in a second. But as we look at the next sign, it's in chapter 6 too. He walks on the water, power of the elements. And then chapter 9, he heals a, a man born blind. And then there's the culmination of all his signs in John chapter 11. Story of Lazarus. It all comes together. His power over nature and the elements and his power over disease and his power over death itself. And he calls Lazarus back from the dead. So we get to the center section of that and the, the feeding of the 5,000. All these signs pointing to something. And I want to draw your attention to, on your bulletin what, what the purpose of all these signs are. Because we get John's purpose statement at the end of his gospel. A lot of times books will have that at the beginning. Here's what this book is all about. We get that at the end of the gospel of John. In John 20, in beginning with verse 30 to 31, it's on your bulletin if you look at it. Here's the purpose of all those signs and what we're talking about, one of them today. The disciples saw Jesus do many miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book, more than just the seven. We know that from the other gospels as well. But these are written so that you continue to what? Believe. So that you continue to believe. That you remind yourself of the power in Jesus Christ and what He can do and what He can change and how He can handle whatever comes your way. That you continue to believe. Why? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, here's the why. You will have life by the power of His name. Here's what I want you to do if you are struggling in faith right now. Would you take this Gospel of John and you would you read through it and would you watch how God develops people in there? Would you watch how God moves through these signs? You just read that Gospel of John over and over and over again because all of what the Gospel of John is doing is, is lifting up Jesus and showing us how great and mighty Jesus is. How He knows our thoughts. How He knows what He's going to do. How He's got this plan for us. He's got a, what we call a very high Christology that He focuses on the divinity of who He is, that He is God come in the flesh as the Word of God. And more than anything else, it's going to help you understand that who He is is enough. He's sufficient. His power can handle whatever concerns you. It's resurrection power. And so as we look at this together, I want you to see how we access or appropriate that power. That word appropriate is just to take for your own, to devote to a special purpose. Claim it. It's not a name it and claim it like the health and wealth gospel. It's just an appropriation of what is already available to you in Jesus Christ that we so rarely access. Because when things go wrong, what we look for is a human a human, horizontal sort of solution. And there is more for us who believe, for us who have faith. God really does intervene and work, and He does it here in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. So let's look, first of all, how to access it according to the, the Philip option. We you humor me here for just a moment? In verses 5 through 7, you see what Jesus says to Philip. Philip, where are we going to get enough bread to feed all of these folks? And Philip, he's got to be some kind of accountant, don't you think? He's a bean counter. He's wondering. He's, he's looking at all the people, and he's looking at all what they might have in the treasury. He's trying to match that up, and he says to Jesus, send them away. We can't do this. There's no place. Jesus is asking Philip, by the way, I think, because he's from that area. Maybe Jesus is saying, hey, Philip, you know any good restaurants around here that we can feed these people? Uh, you know uh, where we can access some, some wheat flour or something, some barley flour so that we can bake some bread? Philip says, no. 
nowhere. The resources we have. If, if we were to work another six, eight months, they're not enough. 200 denarii, 200 days of work. I think Philip forgot about the wine thing, don't you? <laughs> I think Philip forgot about Jesus' power to heal. Whatever the situation, what if Philip had said something like this? Lord, I know I can. I know we can. But I know you can. What are you going to do, Lord? How are you going to feed all these people? Maybe there's some things in your life that, that you just know. No matter how smart you are, no matter how well-resourced you are, and no matter how wise you are, no matter any of the, the natural abilities or resources you have, you think, I, I can't do certain things. And you're young people today up there in the balcony. I see you up there. And I, as, as I, I think about you, I think, maybe you need to pray the prayer, Lord, I can't resist this temptation. Maybe it's not just young people. Maybe it's old people. Or older people, not old people. Older people. I can't resist. I, I can't deal with peer pressure. I, I can't deal with, with my depression or, or my addiction. I, I can't. I don't have what it takes, Lord. I, I don't have what it takes to select the right mate if you're single. I, I don't have what it takes to fix my marriage if you're married. I don't have what it takes to raise these children. Lord, I'm trying. I'm doing the best I can, but I... I can't, I can't do it, Lord. I don't have the power to heal cancer or heal whatever thing that comes my way. I don't have the power to reach my community, Lord. I, I don't have the power to change the world. Oh, but you do, Lord. And will you show me how you want to work through me? How you want to use me? See, that could be. The Philip option, but it's not. So let's look again at the Andrew option, verses 8 and 9. You know Andrew. Every time we see Andrew in the Gospel of John, he's one of those characters that John develops. Every time he's mentioned in the Gospel of John, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. It starts with his brother, Simon Peter, chapter 1, verse 42. He's bringing Peter to Jesus. And here, he's bringing the, the boy. And everything about bringing that boy that Jesus smacks of insufficiency. You see, the, the first thing, that you know, the Peter option, is that we admit our inadequacy and, and we also admit and just rely on God's, the Lord's omnipotence. Andrew option's different. That, by the way, the word omnipotence, isn't that great? That's a great word. Just say, I like to say certain words. Omnipotence. Say that with me, will you? omnipotence. You know what that means. God has all power. And Andrew knows that. But Andrew doesn't demonstrate that because as he brings this little boy to him, all of it smacks of insufficiency. And that's the thing. No matter what we have, when we bring it to Jesus, that's number two on you. Even though we might think it's insufficient. Like it's not enough. Because here's what Andrew does. He brings this small boy, this little lad, with this, these small loaves it maybe four or five inches. Not enough to feed this huge crowd for sure. You know, with these small fish. Hey, I mean, you think he's bringing two fish. This little boy is not lugging Moby Dick around. It's not a huge fish. It's not one of those huge tuna or, or tarpon. It, it, it's little sardine type fish that he's got in his launch. Really just to flavor the bread a little bit. It's all small. Small boys, small loaves, small fish, small faith. What is this among so many? How's this going to work out? What can you do here? Well, we, it's not no faith. It's small faith. We have the faith of a mustard seed, the scripture tells us. We can move mountains and nets. That's what Jesus does. 
He begins to multiply what he had brought to him. That's the third thing on your outline. It's the Jesus option. You bring whatever you have but the Jesus and, and he will multiply it or, or not. You know, not everybody who needs a miracle gets a miracle. It's at his discretion. He's the miracle worker. He's the Lord. This is not some magic formula that we incite him to do certain things that we want him to do when we want him to do. He's not a genie in a bottle where we rub the bottle and get what we want. He knows how he's working and he's building his disciples' faith and he does it for us as well. And so Andrew brings this small Boy, can't, sometimes, sometimes we just lose some of the drama of this, I think. Even though it's been dramatized through the years, I don't know if you grew up in church, but I, I've seen the flannel graph version of this. I've seen the little storybook version. I've seen all the versions of this Jesus of feeding the 5,000, but I, I think they miss it. But Andrew brings that little boy to Jesus. Well, what, is, what is this among so many? I'm, I don't know this. This is not in the scripture. I think maybe Jesus points at him, gives him a little grin, and says, What's this? <laughs> What's this? <laughs> Jesus takes what's been brought to him. Is there anything you know in your life that needs to be brought to him? And as he does that, I, I wonder, as he gives thanks, he pronounces that blessing over the food. I wonder if the disciples aren't peeking a little bit, don't you think? Well, what's going to happen now? <laughs> I can't imagine. But I know there are things in my life, my own ambition, my own ability, my, my own dream that need to be brought to Jesus, even when they're insufficient, even when they're, they're not enough, and see what he does. What about this? As I was thinking about what we need to bring to him, what about our brokenness? What about our grief? What about our hurts? Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, who was the husband of Jim Elliot, 1956, I don't know if anybody in here even alive in 1956. I think there are a few people, and some people even remember 1956. But he was the one who lost his life to the Aka Indians in South America, one of the, the five, as they uh, tried to share Jesus with them. They were met by savages, killed. His wife wrote some powerful words. His journal, one of the greatest quotes I love, and I've quoted to you many times before, is, is one of the most powerful quotes of, of anybody apart from the Bible that I know of. He said, he who... Uh, what, what, how's it go? Let's see. Let me think for just a moment. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Well, that's a great quote, especially about from a man who gave his life for the cause of Christ. But his wife wrote these words about giving our grief and our brokenness to Jesus like the little boy brought the fish. To Andrew, and Andrew brought it to Jesus. He, she says this. What good is that? The point is, the use he makes of it is none of our business. You take your hurt and your pain to Jesus, and you see what he does, and what he does with it is none of our business. It's his business. It's his blessing. It's his hands that make the fish and the, and the loaves matter. It's his blessing. So this grief, this loss, this suffering, this pain, whatever it is which at the moment is God's means of testing my faith and bringing me to the recognition of who he is, that is the thing. You ever look at your hurt that way? Your pain, your pain, your suffering, your difficulty. Is that what you offer to God? Is that what you can give Him 
a multiplier and see not so much more suffering but to see his sufficiency even in the midst of all you're doing. That's the Jesus heart. You put it in his hands and trust that he'll And trust his will and trust his purposes and trust his discretion. He knows what he's doing. I don't. I don't want to dismiss anybody's pain in this place, but I do know this. That is Jesus's, that is the Lord's primary tool to change us. We don't change when we see the light, we change when we feel the heat. When we have to depend on Him. So have you taken all of what concerns you? All of what is broken in you? Taking it to Him. Because that's the response that we see in verses 14 and 15. See, it's real crucial that we see the, the context of this whole setting. It's the Passover. And so the people's thoughts would be thinking about Moses and how Moses helped uh, deliver them from Egypt, how God used Moses to give them the bread from heaven. And so now Jesus in this desolate place is bringing bread from heaven. It's multiplying. And so they'd be thinking about a new and greater Moses already. And as, we, as they begin to think about that, they're ready to receive him as the prophet, the one who came like Moses came long, long ago. And they decide in, in verse 15 to make him king by force. They're going to make him be king because their bellies are full. Because he's provided for them and that's what they're thinking. Their kind of king. But you can't make Jesus king. Jesus is already king. What we do is we ask Him to be our King. You see, Jesus wasn't ready. His timing wasn't right. In this setting, feeding of the 5,000. But there's coming a time when the King comes in on the donkey into Jerusalem as a suffering servant. And He's crowned with thorns on a cross. And the King lays down His life for his subjects, for the forgiveness of their sins. And then he whips death through the resurrection and ascends to the Father, and he's coming again one day. And we believe that with our heads, but now we've got to make him king with our lives and pursue him in his kingdom. Is that what you do? Or do you keep wondering what you're going to get? And how are you going to get Do you honor him with your life, your resources, all you have? Let's pray to God. Father, I know there are people in this place who need a miracle. And Lord, you're the, you're the greatest miracle I know that's available. Jesus, you said that. Father so loved the world that He gave you His only Son, His only begotten, one and only Son. So that whoever believes in you, puts their lives in your hand, pursues you, not just with their mind, but with their hearts and their lives, their very lives, would not perish but have everlasting, everlasting life. So Father, I pray that there's somebody in this place who really realizes who you are, that this is not just some made-up fantasy story. This is reality. It's a historical event where you showed who you were, Jesus, and you show who you are to us. Lord, if you can multiply that little, you can do anything. You can create.
create this world, you can do anything. But Lord, the world is so complex and yet so ordered and it reminds us over and over again of your power, of your sufficiency. You're enough in these moments, Lord. There's somebody in this place who's never surrendered, never made you king, never declared your right to rule and reign their hearts and lives. Today can be the day. We know it, Lord. Because we know that's what you want for all of us. So, Lord, I ask for it. I ask that you would help someone step out and have courage to say, yes, I want Jesus to be my king. Lord, maybe there's a next step for people in this place, the next step of baptism, the next step of church membership, the next step of service. Or, Lord, if there's a public thing that needs to happen, would you help that happen? By your power, by your spirit. In your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen.